Uh, it's a three-word Latin phrase, miserando atque elegendum, uh, which is a little hard to bring into English directly, but I mean, loosely, what it means is choosing through the eyes of mercy, okay? making decisions on the basis of mercy. And I am profoundly convinced that you can analyze everything that Francis has done in the three and a half years since his election to the papacy, from the nitty-gritty details of what do you do about the Vatican Bank, you know, on up to the decision he recently made about divorced and civilly remarried Catholics and access to the sacraments and everything in between. You can analyze it all as an attempt to make mercy real in the daily life of the church. Okay. We'll come to, in a, moment, uh, in a moment, what I see is the three primary areas where you can see this, this kind of uh, fidelity to mercy uh, in action in his papacy. But let, let's begin with this. You have invited a journalist to give this talk. Now, of course, you could have asked a theologian. Uh, you could have asked a, uh, a famous literary figure. Uh, you, know, you could have asked a politician. You could have asked any number of people, but you chose a reporter. Okay? And if you have the right to expect anything from a reporter, and frankly, I would not recommend that you expect very much, uh, but if you have a right to expect anything, it is that we would get our facts right. Okay? So let us begin tonight with a fact, not a hunch, not a theory, not an anecdotal impression, not a gut-level instinct, but a hardcore empirical, take it to the bank, hang your head on it fact. And that fact is, as of today, September 2016, Pope Francis is by far the most admired religious leader on the planet and one of the most admired public figures of any sort. Okay? Now that is an empirical fact. Uh, and I could demonstrate its facticity to you in a variety of ways. Let's start with his Twitter following. Do you all know that he just broke the 30 million barrier for his combined, for the, he has nine Twitter accounts, of course, in nine different languages, but that combined following is now in excess of 30 million? That makes him by far the most followed religious leader in the Twitter universe. If you will excuse my guilty Catholic pride, he left the Dalai Lama in the dust a long time ago. Okay. Now, he is not yet the most followed human being on Twitter. Do you know who that is as of today? Kim Kardashian is a good guess, but bam, bam, no. Uh, the correct answer as of today, ladies and gentlemen, is Katy Perry. Katy Perry. The top four in order are Katy Perry, Barack Obama, Justin Bieber, and Lady Gaga. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, surely the apocalypse cannot be far behind. <laughs> but, you know, give the poor Pope a break. He's only been on Twitter three and a half years, okay? 30 million is not so bad. Uh, or, if you want another bit of empirical confirmation, let's talk about his poll numbers. Again, it is a fact, not a hunch or theory, but a fact, that in every corner of the world in which public opinion can be scientifically measured, okay, this pope has approval ratings that politicians and celebrities would sacrifice their children to pagan gods to obtain. Okay? For example, the most recent uh, CNN USA Today Gallup survey of uh, public opinion in the United States which was taken a couple of months uh, after his trip uh, to the States last year, and of course the one year anniversary uh, of that trip is, is right around the corner, it's next week. <clears throat> so this was a couple of months after that trip, so some of the immediate afterglow had already worn off. Okay? So you can't attribute this exclusively to a trip bump. Okay? What that poll found uh, is that 78% uh, of Americans generally had a positive impression of Francis. Only 5%, 5, had a negative impression, and the rest didn't answer. Okay, so that's the general American public, 78% approval. If you don't think that either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump would take that number and run screaming into the night, you have not been paying attention to the 2016 race. Okay. Uh, but more interesting to me uh, about that poll was the finding among American Catholics. What it found is that Pope Francis has a 90%. Let me say that again. 90%. That's 9-0. Okay? 90% approval rating among American Catholics. Now, sit with that number for a moment. And juxtapose it with what I presume all of us in this room know about how badly divided the Catholic Church in the United States is on almost everything. 
Okay? The truth of it is, under ordinary circumstances, it would be hard to get 90% of American Catholics to agree that today is Wednesday. Okay? Because on the left, you would have an element that would suspect a hierarchical plot to control our sense of time. And on the right, you would have a crowd of grunts that thinks we should still be using the Julian calendar. Right? Uh, so, I, you know, I would suggest to you that in that context, uh, a 90% approval rating is absolutely remarkable. Uh, and frankly, if we ever get around to beatifying and canonizing Jorge Mario Bergoglio, I would suggest this could count as his first merit. <laughs> now, do we have any canon lawyers in the room? Yes, I know, the miracles in a sainthood cause have to come after the candidate's death. Okay, this is just for purposes of fun, right? <laughs> or, if you need yet more proof uh, of the Pope's celebrity status, let's talk about all the magazine covers he's done. Okay, uh, as you know, he was Time's Person of the Year. Now, admittedly, not the first Pope to have that on. The first was John the Twenty-Third. the second was Pope John Paul II, but catch the point. John the Twenty-Third had been Pope four and a half years when he was named Time's Person of the Year. John Paul II had been Pope 12 years when he got the honor. Do you know how long Francis had been Pope when they named him Person of the Year? Three months. Three months, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? Or, here's my favorite example, okay? Because Time was not the first magazine to declare him person of the year. You know which one was? It was the Italian edition of Vanity Fair. Oh. Vanity Fair, folks, okay? This is not exactly a house organ of the Catholic Church, okay? Uh, and it included a tribute from that well-known Vaticanologist, Elton John, uh, who described Pope Francis as, quote, a miracle of humility in an era of vanity. Okay, a miracle of humility in an era of vanity. It's a great line. I am waiting for the world to forget that Elton John said it, so I can see. Uh, and, you know, that just scratches the surface. I mean, hey, at one stage, I asked a colleague of mine to try to add up all of the magazine covers in the various parts of the world that Pope Francis has been on, and the answer was, it's incalculable. Uh, it's simply too many to count. Uh, you know, I mean, every, I mean, for God's sakes, folks, he was on the cover of the Rolling Stone. Okay, and let me date myself here. Yes, I did buy five copies for my mother. Okay, for those of you who get the Dr. Hood, you know, reference. Uh, and we could go on and on, cataloging examples of the Pope's celebrity status. There is no doubt that he has become a pop culture phenomenon. However, the truly interesting question is, uh, is there steak beneath the sizzle? Right? Is there fire beneath the smoke? In other words, is this merely a new celebrity who is burst upon the global stage, or is there something deeper and more substantive going on here to which the world is responding? And I want to suggest to you that the answer to that question is yes, there is something deeper, and in a word, it's mercy. And not merely the vocabulary of mercy, but the perception that this is that unique public figure who walks his own talk, for whom this isn't simply rhetoric. It is actually a way of life. Okay. Now, granted, most of the world is not hanging. At